everyone. Welcome to Shakespeare Walkthrough, Macbeth, for better essays and class discussions. I'm Rod Robertson. Um, today we are going to start Act 1, but first you need a bit of background information to understand what was going on. Macbeth was a real king. Uh, he was alive in feudal times in Scotland. He was the king of Scotland, and according to my Scottish friends, he actually wasn't a bad king. Now, you're going to see a portrait of a really bad king in this particular play, uh, but the real Macbeth actually probably was, uh, wasn't that bad. But I'm, I, again, this isn't a historical reading. If you're interested in the real history of Macbeth, and you can go and you can look it up on the internet. Uh, this is more of a thematic and psychological close reading, as I mentioned in my previous video, of the play. Uh, but you do need a little bit of this stuff. Uh, so, feudal times. Uh, I think it was like around 1000 or something like that, that Macbeth was around. Uh, and the importance here is on feudal times, because you kind of have to understand the different characters and how things work. Uh, if you remember your grade seven ge uh, history lessons, uh, feudal times, feudalism basically worked while you had a kingdom. The whole kingdom was ruled by a particular king. And in this case, our guy is named Duncan in Scotland. And he was a apparently, well, according to Shakespeare, he was he was like a he was a godlike figure. He was an amazing guy. He was the, the gentle Duncan, uh, exaggerated to pieces, of course, but, but there it is. Uh, so you had, you had one king ruling the whole thing. So that's what you had. You had one king ruling all of Scotland, but the feudal, feudalism meant that each, the whole kingdom itself was divided into these different uh, lordships, or these different domains that were ruled by these lords. And each of these lords was a pretty tough guy. Uh, they had the power to raise taxes, which means they could also... Uh, raise armies and they were they were actually expected to raise armies so that when the king needed them they the, the king could call on these thanes in scotland they're called thanes the king could call on these thanes uh to repel you know to attack england for example or ireland or the french was a famous target back in those days so so that that's how it worked but of course human nature being human nature if you give a big strong smart guy an army Eventually, out of 10 big, strong, smart guys with armies, uh, you're going to get one who says, hey, I, Duncan, who the hell's this Duncan guy? I'm better and smarter and stronger than Duncan, so I'm going to take him over. So that's exactly what happened. Um, when the play opens, uh, it's the end of a rebellion. It's the end of a civil war. Um, this guy... <clears throat> well, let me just read through these, make sure I'm not forgetting anything. So it is feudal times, and Scotland is ruled by a single king, the gentle Duncan. The king relies on the power of the feudal lords called thanes. One thane, now here we go. So this is MacDonwald. He gets cocky, and he wants to be king, and he attacks Duncan. So at the end, as the play opens, uh, it's the end of the rebellion. MacDonwald has been defeated by Macbeth. Now, what is it? Yeah, so th this is, these names are kind of important because they come up in the, you might know that witches appear in Macbeth, and so these, these prophecies and these, these names, you kind of have to know them. So MacDonwald was the Thane of Cawdor, and it was generally in this area in Scotland. It still exists, I think. Uh, Gloms, Macbeth is the Thane of Gloms in, in this area. Macduff is the Thane of, Thane of Fife in this area. And there's Banquo. I don't know where, where Banquo's from, but anyway, another guy named Banquo is there. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of these things that you're going to th see in the play. Um, so there's a rebellion. Norway, by the way, joins in. MacDonwald, you know, makes a deal with Norway and says, hey, you want to come help me take over Duncan? I'll give you this piece of land or whatever. Um, that's, you know, politics and war throughout history. That's basically what we did. Um, but Macbeth... As the play opens, as I said, Macbeth, the Thane of Gloms, defeats MacDonwald and becomes the hero of the day. He really, really is the hero of the day. He's a, he's a great general. He's a great warrior. He's brave. He's courageous. And all of his energies are put to good use. And he's honored by uh, everyone in Scotland, uh, especially by the king, who's very grateful. Naive. Duncan is, is, is quite naive. Uh, he trusts him too much. Um, so very soon at the beginning of the play, we see, yay, Macbeth, you saved us all. And then three witches arrive and plant in Macbeth the seeds of ambition and the cycle of civil war begins again because the witches are personification of Macbeth's own ambition. That's the simplest explanation, the ambition thing. I'm going to go much deeper than simply ambition. Usually in grade, you know, high school, 
teachers that don't go into a lot of depth, they'll just say, yeah, he was ambitious and this is what happened. There's a lot more going on below the surface than just ambition. So I'm going to get into a lot of that. Um, so yeah, I think that's all you need to know. Again, uh, if you're interested in the politi- in the historical background of the of the Scottish and English situation, you can go ahead and head and have a look. Um, oh yeah, I should mention uh, McDon- uh, Donald Bain and Malcolm are the sons of Duncan, and they escape. Malcolm goes to England down here, and they raise an army and they attack Scotland again. I'm I'm not particularly interested in the the real history of it, but you can you can you can have a look. Okay, so um so these are my notes. I'm not going to go through these in great detail, but I'm just going to introduce the characters very quickly. Uh, Macbeth, of course, is our anti-hero. Uh, the whole play revolves around his insecurities. Uh, I, again, this I'm doing a thematic analysis, a thematic close analysis of this play, and I think Shakespeare's got a he's got a point to make in his, his like he does in, in in most of his plays and the point that he's making here is that an insecure man uh, commits horrors frightened weak insecure men commit horrors and you're going to see in what ways macbeth is insecure and weak and how he is pathologically eager to prove himself a man uh, it's it's a brilliant psychological portrait. Uh, so that's Macbeth, and there's a lot of stuff going on here. And what's the way it's going to work uh, is here's Act One, for example. We're going to read through this, and these are my notes here. This red stuff. Uh, these notes basically come from these notes. So you may or may not need this particular document, but it's it's a cheat sheet, and you might find it useful. Uh, the next most important character, and equally important, is Lady Macbeth. Now, a weak and insecure man. Is bad enough, but then you get this overly ambitious, horrible, devouring mother, archetypal wife, and you've got a real recipe for disaster because the, these two together are, you know, they're, they're absolutely deadly. He's desperate to prove that he, he is a man, and his wife knows that, and she manipulates that insecurity to get what she wants. There's a lot, of, there's a lot going on under, under the surface here. We're going to get into it. Um, so foils, a character foil. The way character foil works is uh, uh, is we, we, we hold up the, the main character. We, we have our main character. We have our Harry Potter, and we, we array all these characters around Harry Potter. And the way that these characters, the other characters, the supporting characters' personalities reflect on our hero. So, for example, uh, Ron Weasley's kind of cowardice, funny cowardice, makes Harry look much braver by contrast. Hermione Granger's uptightedness and kind of priggishness um, makes Harry look more human and approachable and, and likable. So those kinds of things. So Banquo is very much a, a foil. He's a decent guy. He's a human guy, but he's a decent guy. And he's able to restrain the more primitive uh, selfish impulses in him. And 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 and, uh, and he, he's a very interesting character. Um, and he's part of Shakespeare's thesis, Shakespeare's theme, which is which is about how to be a, a decent person. Uh, Duncan, the naive good king, he's definitely the benevolent father archetype, very much a god figure. Malcolm is the uh, is the worthy hero archetype. He's the son of Duncan, and he he's he he proves himself. Shakespeare takes great pains to demonstrate what an honorable character looks like, and and that's that's our hero. That's the Harry Potter human flawed, not perfect, but but deserving of of hero status, deserving of the hero the hero the purpose the job of the hero is to heal the wasteland and and, and Scotland becomes a wasteland very quickly. Now the witches are very interesting. Everybody loves them. They're just really good fun horror show, great Hollywood fun. Fair enough. Uh, uh, but they're also, again, we're going to do a psycholo- psychological analysis, and they are personifications of Macbeth's psyche. They're, they're re- projections of, of, of his own pathologies in, in outward form. Um, okay, so those are the main characters. Um, that's a bit of the, the background to the story. And uh, in my notes here, these are the themes and motifs. Again, I put number one, it's the manhood theme. It's the most interesting one I find and the most chilling one and perhaps the most relevant one for today's world in our changing times. Um, yeah, we're going to go through these. These will pop up as we go. Um, there's the, yeah, here's the, the Malcolm quest, the hero's quest to heal the wasteland. You might be familiar with this from Joseph Campbell. Anyway, okay, so... That's our introduction, and now let's start the play.
Okay, so act one, scene one. So the play opens like all good plays should open, like all good movies should open, and like your essay should open, they capture people's attention. And what better way to capture people's attention than with a horror show? Uh, and this is the way the play begins. Um, we're huddled around a cauldron. We see three figures. We see three figures huddled around this cauldron, chanting these spooky chants and throwing in, I don't know, bats and toads and stuff like that or whatever. It's a great Hollywoody, Halloweeny fun. It's a spectacle. Um, Shakespeare's audience, by the way, did believe in witches. Uh, it, there's, there's, there's a Christian undertone to all of our older literature, and even our current literature has the, by its absence, there's a Christian undertone because that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the Western culture. Uh, and in Shakespeare's time, uh, it was a Christian era, and they did believe in a literal heaven and a literal hell. That becomes important later on. Uh, and they did believe in witches, and witches were the minions of uh, Satan, of, of, of the dark powers. Now, it doesn't come out overtly in this, so you can just enjoy them as witches. I, however, uh, like them because of what I just mentioned, was that as, as, as psychological projections of Macbeth's psyche, um, of his wife's manipulations, of temptation and of ambition. Again, if your teacher is just doing a light reading of it, they'll say, oh, they represent temptation. They're a metaphor, a personification of temptation. There's something darker going on in there. They're, they're a manifestation of Macbeth's corrupt soul. Um, they're also kind of these trickster gods, uh, wise trickster gods. Every culture, every culture on the planet has their trickster gods, and they're kind of a universal way to explain bad luck. I mean, bad luck happens to us, and whose fault is it? Well, let's let's call it the little fairies that, that came and ruined my day by making my cow sick or something like that. So, so they're, they're kind of trickster gods. There are these spirits, these unfriendly spirits that are playing with human lives. They're, they're, they're a version of that. And it, you plug it into any culture and it really works. Uh, there's a Japanese version of Macbeth, by the way, and they have a really, really good portrait of, the, uh, of, 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 of this kind of god. It really fits into the Japanese mythology very nicely in folklore. They're also quite wise. They know what Macbeth wants to hear, and they give him what he wants to hear, which leads us to the first big theme. Okay, so as I said, it opens. They're huddled around this cauldron, and they're chanting this stuff. And the first which says, When shall we three meet again in thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won, that will be ere the set of sun, before the set of sun. Where the place upon the heath, and the heath is this high plateau plain that that makes up a lot of uh, the, the la physical landscape of Scotland. Where the place upon the heath there to meet with Macbeth? I come, Grey Malkin is the cat, the famous cat that the witches hang out with. Paddock calls, anon. Fair is foul and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and filthy air. Okay, so we learned that there's a battle and they're going to meet with Macbeth. So this is this fate. Right at the very beginning, we know Macbeth is walking into a trap. In the Japanese film, by the way, they use uh, cobwebs and spiders. So the, the witches are, are portrayed as these spider figures, which makes sense. Um, now, this is the most important thing in this particular beginning, besides hope, hopefully you've just enjoyed it, not my version of it, but hope you've, hopefully you've watched a movie. I've, I'm going to mention this many times throughout my videos. Is don't forget to watch one of the movies a bunch of the movies. My favorite one is the 1979 one with Judy Dench and Ian McKellen. Anyway, so the most important thing here besides simply enjoying it is this line. Uh, it introduces one of the grand themes. Uh, the, 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 the motifs I'm going to talk about in a later video, the motifs are really important. They bind the work together. These patterns of repeated images and themes uh, that you'll see again and again. And one of the most important ones is the appearance versus reality theme. So uh, the fair is foul. That can mean the weather is good or the weather is bad. We don't quite know. The good is the bad. The bad is the good. Not just the good weather. We don't know what that is, but also the, the good moral climate. Good is bad and bad is good. Everything is turned upside down. Everything in the play is turned topsy-turvy. The, that's the wasteland theme. Uh, in all of your stories, all of your video games, there's there's a wasteland because if there wasn't a wasteland then there'd be no reason to, for the hero to take action mm -hmm. so in the avengers movies there's a wasteland there's something some bad stuff has come up into the world and disrupted the way we normally go about our lives spider-man had the green goblin comes up and and starts to mess around with i'm going to work i'm eating a sandwich what what the hell's going on all of a sudden this evil stuff happens the 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 proper world 
the world of, of ordinary action has been turned upside down and it's become a wasteland. Call in the hero and the hero is the hero's job is to say is to is, is to heal it. Really interesting. So uh, appearance versus reality, equivocation. We don't know what's good. We don't know what's bad. The world has been turned upside down. Everything is destabilized. Um, it's 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 unclear. Hover through the fog and filthy air. Uh, you have to understand what equivocation means. It's kind of a, 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 a fancy, old-fashioned kind of word. But to equivocate means to say something in a way that can be understood in several different ways. Now, the politicians, the best way to understand this is politicians. If you're a politician, you've got millions of people, and you want everyone to vote for you, which means you've got a million different ways of, in, of interpreting the world to contend with. And so when you say something, that something, you must frame it, you must phrase it in a way that what you say could be understood in multiple different ways, which means you really have to say nothing. That's what politicians are really good at, at saying nothing, but seeming to say something. And what that does is if you say a nothing, you send out a nothing into the world, into a head, then that head is now free to interpret that nothing in any way that that head wants to interpret it. So that's how politicians uh, win their votes, by being equivocators. Could mean A, could mean B. And you, leave the, and you leave the equivocator free, you leave the politician free to say, hey, I, I didn't, no, look, look at my record. I didn't say A. I actually, what I meant was B, when in actuality it could be either or. So that's what the witches are. They're these great equivocators, and they come into Macbeth's life, and they drop the seed of nothing, and Mac they know that Macbeth will interpret it in the way that he wants to interpret it and in the way that will lead him to tragedy. Um, that's the most important thing here. So that great line, fair is foul and foul is fair. Okay, so then we can move on to Act 1, Scene 2. Okay, Act 1, Scene 2. Um, so after all that witchy stuff, the audience is enthralled, and we continue to be enthralled because there are reports of a bloody battle. Um, there's not too much to talk about in this scene, so I'm going to go fairly quickly through it. I'm not going to read this in total detail. I'm just going to point out what's important and make sure the plot elements are all in place, which is basically what this scene is about. Uh, it opens, as I mentioned, there, there was a civil war going on. Uh, in this scene, we learn that Macbeth and his buddy Banquo, the two great generals, have defeated uh, the evil Macdonwald, the traitor Macdonwald. So we got a camp near Forez where this battle was going on, and there's all these alarms. You can hear all this chaos going on off stage, I suppose. Uh, the King Duncan is there, the son Malcolm, the other son Donald Bain, who doesn't, who's not as important as Malcolm, and, a gen, and, and one of the thanes, Lennox. He's a decent guy. You'll see Lennox a few times. But he's not, he's not a main character. He's just a static character. Uh, so they're all sitting around, and they're waiting for news, as the generals will, and this, everything's going off, or as the, the main leaders waiting for news to come back from the front. Well, the news does come back from the front in the form of a bleeding sergeant. So Duncan says, what bloody man is that? So what's going on? Can he report what happened? And Malcolm says, this is the sergeant who, like a good and hardy soldier, fought against my captivity. So Malcolm was obviously taken uh, captive, and the sergeant um, uh, saved him. Again, so uh, I, think, I think I mentioned that one of the main themes of the whole play is manhood and how to behave properly in the world, what to do with your manly strength in the world, how to put it to good use. And here we go, this little, it, it's a micro, it's a micro introduction to that here. There's a sergeant who did a good job. He sacrificed himself for the, to, to save the hero, to save the Harry Potter, because Malcolm very much is uh, the Harry Potter. Okay, so tell us, tell the king how the fight uh, was going as you left it. Doubtful it stood as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. So I love that first line for some reason. Doubtful it stood. So it was it, what Shakespeare's trying to do here is he's, he's trying to increase the tension. So, oh, my God, oh, my God. So he's not going to just say, yeah, we won. And then there'd be at the end of the scene. There'd be no tension. There'd be no rising action. Remember, rising action in, in all drama, the dramatic form is this rising action leading to a climax. Uh, that's a simplified version of it. I'm going to get into a little bit more detail later. 
But anyway, uh, the merciful McDonald, worthy to be a rebel for that, blah, blah, blah. So he went over to But all too weak. So McDonald was going merciless. It was a pretty tough battle. The, the, the rebels were, were, had, had the upper hand, but it wasn't enough for brave Macbeth. Well, he deserves that name. So this is important. Pay attention to this because your teachers will ask you to do a character analysis at some point, And you have to... You have to understand that Macbeth begins the story as the Batman. He begins the story as the good hero, brave, fierce warrior. He's great general, physically strong, but then, as you'll see, psychologically terribly, terribly weak, and that's his great tragic flaw. So... For brave Macbeth, well, he deserves that name, disdaining fortune, blah, blah, blah. He cut through, he carved a passage through the enemy. So you can imagine this great you know, guy going, carving a passage through the enemy until he faced the slave, one of the opposing generals, and he unseamed him, great line, great poetry. He unseamed the enemy from the navel to the chops. So he cut him wide open. Nice bloody stuff. Again, great way to start up. Grab people's attention with we all love spooky stuff and violence. So here we go. Macbeth starts off as a noble, honorable, highly respected hero. Oh, valiant cousin, says the good King Duncan. Gentleman, worthy gentleman. And indeed he is at the beginning. Um, again, so this just some more of this uh, description of the battle stuff. You can get into that. You, just, you can go on to YouTube and find a side-by-side -side analysis if you want to. That's not my job here to interpret every single line. Um, but you should know this. There's a little... Interesting thing, your teachers, depending on how your teachers test this, uh, some teachers will have you, you know, do tests where you have to say, well, who, who else was fighting against Duncan? And one of the things is Norway had joined McDonald. So here it is here. But the Norway Norwegian lord surveying advantage with burnished, uh, furnished, furbished arms and new supplies of men began a fresh assault. So again, it's the, it's the, it's the, this sergeant is a pretty good storyteller. He's not just coming out and saying what happened. He's saying, well, we did okay, but then Macbeth beat him back. But then Norway came in and things looked bad again. And the Duncan said, oh, my God, were our captains, Macbeth and Banquo, afraid of this? Were dismayed not this, our captains? And the, the sergeant laughs. Ah, yeah, they were afraid. Like eagles are afraid of sparrows and lions are afraid of rabbits. That's how much they were afraid. So, again, we're establishing our heroes in a very tense scene. Give and take, give and take. Are we going to win? Are we not going to win? Uh, so Crannon's, yeah, so, so they came back. And he says, we, we, we won. Um, but, my, but I'm dying. But I am faint. My gashes cry for help. So he says, go ahead, get these guys. Get these guys. Get this guy a surgeon because he's, he's dying. Uh, and your wounds smack of honor. And again, that's that's the the sacrifice. One of the one of the themes of the play is the is, is how to behave in the world, and and how do we find meaning in the world? And one of the ways we find meaning is through sacrifice. And wait till you get to the end. It's a beautiful, beautiful. It's the sacri It's the it's the Harry Potter story all over again. Well, Harry Potter is the Macbeth story all over again. How do we live decently in the world? And how do we find meaning? And one of those ways is through is through the sacrifice. And we get these little, you see, this is the motif. I'm going to talk about mot motifs later. And that's how motifs work. We get these introductions to them, and they keep returning, they keep returning, they keep returning, like a lovely phrase in, in a song or in a symphony. That's how it all works. Uh, okay, so Ross enters. Now Ross is a, is a is another minor character. He's like Lennox. They're necessary to 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 move the plot forward, to give information. Exposition is basically what they do. Um, and thought uh, Ross enters, and da, 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 God save the king. What does he say? From Fife, great king of the Norway. Okay, so he gives the news that the that the that the the that the the enemy surrenders is what he says. Um, da, 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 and to conclude, the victory fell on us is what he says. He does the same kind of thing. If you read through this, go back and read a side by side translation. And he says, yeah, it, was, it looked pretty bad. It looked pretty bad. It looked pretty bad. But in, to conclude, Macbeth pulled, pulled it off and, um, and the victory fell on us. To that uh, Bologna's bridegroom, lapped in proof, confronted the enemy with self comparisons point for point, and we won. Great happiness. Yay, Macbeth is the hero of the day. Macbeth wins the day. And to boot, we've got some money. Norway was so roundly defeated that to recompense, in, in recompense, he paid $10,000 to the king's general use. Now, here's some irony. Again, this is, this is important analysis, and you kind of have to know this for your, 
for your papers and for discussions. This is the stuff teachers like to hear. So pay the, this is I put these little flags out and pay attention to these because these will get you your good marks. Um, the Duncan says, "No more that thane of Cawdor shall deceive our bosom interest. Go pronounce his present death." Pronounce the traitor's present death, and with his formal ti former title, greet Macbeth. So the Thane of Carter was Macdonwald, and he's been defeated, and he's gone. And there, now there's an empty Thane ship. Now there's an empty uh, title to be given. And the title, you know, as I said, in the feudal times, it, it's great wealth and prestige established, uh, connected to it. So the original Thane of Cawdor, Macdonwald, is dead. He's the traitor. Now give it to Macbeth. Well, obviously, you see the irony here. No more the Thane of Cawdor shall deceive us. Our heart's interest? Yeah, well, think again, buddy. Macbeth becomes Cawdor and does indeed deceive Duncan's uh, bosom. Okay, so there's that, uh, that delicious kind of, uh, you know, dramatic irony. Dramatic irony. We know, we know something that the characters in the play don't know. I'll see it done. What he hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won. Okay, so that's the end of Act 1, Scene 2.